Well, shall I get going then, Judy? That would be wonderful. Thank you, Peter. Okay. Well, welcome to Dal Swinton, everybody. It's a very strange way of getting everybody to come to Dal Swinton. Um, the uh, Dal Swinton Gardens have been part of the garden scheme for over 50 years. I think it's 56 years. And there's a little plaque in one of our beds which um, commemorates the fact, and Sarah and I walk past it most days when we commute to the estate office. So we've, we've been involved, and Sarah has also, uh, is probably known better to a lot of you as she's vice chairman of the Scottish Garden Scheme. Um, I'm going to go through, because you're not with us, although I've welcomed you to us, I'm going to follow the following trajectory of my talk. I'm going to talk a bit about the location. I'm then going to go through the history of Dal Swinton. And then as my talk is titled Landscape, Grounds and Garden, I'm going to talk about the landscape, grounds and garden a little bit. And then I'm going to talk about the impact of the garden on Dal Swinton. And finally, how we do it and how we make the garden happen. Um, so uh, I, bear with me and I, we will take you on a, a little tour and see where we end up. Um, so the first bits to make sure the screen changes. So th this is the view from Dal Swinton across the Nith Valley looking towards Criffel. And this is what we look at every day. And, and we reside in the Nith Valley. And I would suggest to you that that view hasn't changed for millennia. That is what we, we have. And we think it's rather wonderful. Um, it, it sets the whole place off. What, what has then happened over the, over the centuries is people have uh, changed the land in order to make it the way that they want it. And to some degree, that's what I'm going to be reviewing with you this afternoon. But, but that view of Criffel is the essence of Dalswinton, and that's what we reside in. Um, for those of you who don't know Dalswinton, just to give you a location, we are just north of Dumfries, where the red dot is. Uh, we're a very strategic location in that anybody wanting to invade Scotland from England, one of the main routes would have been up the Nith Valley. And Dalswinton uh, is positioned nicely on a hill and it looks over the whole of the valley. So you command the valley uh, from, from Dalswinton House, which is um, exciting, uh, particularly in the current days. So um, if we go right the way back to AD, uh, sorry, I'll go forward. If we go right the way back to AD 82, the Romans were here and it was a very long way north. And this is one of their forts that they, we think they had three or four, and there were, on this particular fort, 800 men. And they say that 800 men would have given a population of about 3,000 people in the near vicinity. So it was strategic, and the Romans felt it was important. I think what one has to remind oneself all the time is that back then, and until not very long ago, the whole of the Nith Valley would have been marshland. It wouldn't have been... Uh, the sort of cultivated fields that we have today and there would have been much more wooded area and that the, the whole of the lands the, the landscape itself would have been the same but what what was on the land would have been completely different uh, so what we're going to look at as we go forward is how that has changed um, moving on through the years we've come forward to 1307 and a chap called John Common, who owned a lot of land throughout Scotland. He was actually known as the Red Common. And he's the, the picture of the fellow up on the left with the red face, hence the name Red, red Common. And he had a castle on Dalswinton Hill overlooking the valley in the strategic location, which I described earlier. Um, he did a deal, uh, legend has it, he did a deal with Bruce, Robert the Bruce, all known to us, and he's the man in the picture at the bottom. And Bruce and him did a deal whereby Bruce would um, allow Comyn to become King of Scotland and uh, 
give Bruce some of his land because the commons had a huge amount of land. And Bruce believed that uh, Common had done a deal with the English. And as a result, he coaxed him into Greyfriars Church in Dumfries. And he said that they didn't need any bodyguards. And the picture on the left hand side depicts Bruce killing Common at the altar in Greyfriars Church and then declaring himself in charge. And he came out to Dalswinton and the castle that was here at the time, he took it down. And what you're left with it, it was um, Bruce declared that there should be no castle on Common Hill, or, or, on the top of the hill. And they created a, car, a castle, which was a Z castle at the bottom of the hill. And um, that is the picture of the tower that you can see through the gates with the azaleas in front of it. I've also put a picture of a tower on the island and the loch, and I'd like you to remember that, but um, we'll come back to that later. Uh, but one of the things would have been nice is the King of Scotland um, aspired to have his castle at Dalswinton, and maybe that'll return one day, you never know. Um, so, moving on, uh, we then move forward to really the creator of Dalswinton in my book. Between 1307 and 1770, this land was fought over by the English and Scots by the border reavers. And there was a huge amount of um, destruction. And the land was pillaged and the, um, there was a lot of rape and all sorts of unsatisfactory comings and goings. Um, but in, 13, in 1770, roughly, a fairly amazing man called Patrick Miller um, was a banker in, the, in Edinburgh and he was paid 5,000 guineas in 1805. So that just tells you how much money he was making. Uh, and as a result, he bought Dalswinton sight unseen. And when he visited Dalswinton, he was so appalled by how poor it was and how, how poor the fields were that he was absolutely furious and he wanted to sell it. And the painting that you see in front of you is by Alexander Naismith. And it's believed that Naismith persuaded him that actually Dalswinton was a pretty amazing place and he should come down here and reside down here. And you can see that's a picture of the house sitting in front of Criffle, which was the view that I referred to earlier. And Miller, um, I think is pretty uncelebrated in Scotland. He, he did a huge amount. He was responsible with working with Adam Smith for the modern day mortgage. He was chairman of the Caron Company in Falkirk and which created the Caronade, which went on to win the Battle of Trafalgar. Um, and moving just quickly on, he was also responsible for well, he built Dalswinton House. I'm going to go one stride further forward. You can see at the bottom, he was also responsible for sponsoring the first steamboat in Britain, which uh, went on to um, its engine is currently in the Science Museum in London. And it's 001 in the engineering department in the Science Museum because it was the first engine to power a vehicle. So we, we're pretty proud of it. And the lock which you see the tower on is uh, in this image here is um, uh, it was the lock where the steamboat sailed. Um, that tower, which you saw in the previous picture with Red Common, we had the Castle Society visit Dumfrey, uh, Dalswinton about five years ago. And one of the members of that visit believed that what Miller did was he took the tower off the little castle that was at the bottom of the hill, which was a Z castle, and he moved one of the towers and he put it uh, so he could see it from his dining room. And you see it now residing in the middle of what we call the loch. And he would have seen uh, from his dining room, he could, see the, he could see the loch and he could see this tower. So um, an important piece. But Miller built Dalswinton House, and I'll just go back to the previous slide. Um, and there it is. That's what, what he built. That's clearly not a picture not taken in his time. It was taken in 
we'll come on to the McAlpine Lenny's in a minute. Um, but it was a pretty grand house uh, which which he put up, and um, it certainly isn't going to blow away. Uh, but that is the, that is the centre of things at Dalswinton. He also built the stable block, which is a very fine stable block, and you can see it there. It's now being converted into various um, flats, and we have a holiday flat there as well. Um, the village was built by Miller uh, in its entirety, and it's rather sweet. It's got that double story on that side of the road, and then it's got a single story on the other side of the road. Uh, he built all the farms, which was, amounted to about 11 farms, uh, which he then set up with tenant farmers. And one of his tenant farmers on the other side of the river was Robbie Burns. And he was a, a great benefactor of Burns and Burns uh, owed quite a lot to him. Uh, and he Burns lived in Ellisland Farm itself. Um, he was also a big agriculturalist. So not only was he an industrialist, he believed in agriculture. And the tower on the right is called Clonfeckel Tower. Um, and Clonfeckel Tower was a, is a folly that was built in order to commemorate some grass which he developed, um, which was called Fion grass, which uh, came from a, a mixture of Ireland and Italy. And he 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 helped develop the grass, and that grass um, is no longer because it's no longer seen as being uh, that productive. But but he was an agriculturist in his own right. So. He was incredibly active in the period that he was at Dalswinton. Unfortunately, his son uh, was a bit more errant and he decided to, um, he was a gambler. There's various letters um, from him back to his father asking for more and more money. And he eventually took the ultimate gamble, which was to try and become a member of parliament. And he took on the Duke of Buccleuch's candidate in order to become the member of parliament. And he lost. And, and not only did he lose, but he lost the family fortune. So the Millers, unfortunately, uh, had to sell Dalswinton. And the next family that they sold them to was the McAlpine Lennies. And the McAlpine Lennies bought it in 1819. And they had, um, they had made their money in tea. And these pictures are taken in 1893. And they, they're rather fun. I mean, they actually show Dalswinton as it was. So going into landscape, they show the loch not manicured, but the loch as the loch. Uh, they show amazing glass houses in the wall garden, which are no longer there. The wall garden is still there, but the glass houses, I think the, the glass house just above the pump is still there, um, but the uh, they have changed fairly dramatically. Um, I think there were eight gardeners in, in the walled garden. And you can see on the right hand picture, there's a rather nice picture of the pump in the middle of the walled garden, which is still there um, and rather nice flowers. And then there's a picture of the village as well. Now the McAlpine Lennies, um, they, they're not embarrassed as the, their uh, successor is still alive called Ian McAlpine Lenny. And they're not embarrassed to tell you they really had a hundred years of fun at Dalswinton. They uh, played a lot of bridge and they shot a lot of things uh, all the way around Dalswinton. There's a huge number of pictures of gamekeepers uh, on the estate, which I haven't put on this. This is a garden talk, not a gamekeeper's talk. Um, one of the nice stories about the McAlpine Lennies was they built this rather special church, which we call the Barony Kirk. And the, the then um, Mrs. McAlpine Lenny was very much the matriarch of the area and she was a member of the Kirkmahoe, which is the local parish, Kirkmahoe Parish Council. She was an elder and she, um, in the church, uh, decided that it was a bit boring and a bit dull and that they ought to have some music. So this was in the Kirkton Church, not this church. In the Kirkton Church they should have music and with the, the music, she, she went and purchased for them without consulting the other elders, an organ. And the organ was delivered and they had a couple of services and it's all minuted that the services took place. And some elders got together, I think some pretty stuffy lawyers from Dumfries, if the truth be known, 
and they decided that this really wasn't on and wasn't something that they were going to entertain. So they threw Mrs. McAlpine's Lenny's organ out of the church. And Mrs. McAlpine Lenny was not to be done by this. And she marched down to Liverpool and brought and bought herself a pre-packed church, which she duly erected at Dalswinton, and she inserted said organ into the church and then uh, went about getting a congregation. And it's rumoured that 300 people attended the first service. I find it difficult because we've tried our hardest and we can get 175 in the church. We certainly can't get 300. So, um, but it, it, it's a really fun church and it still goes today. Um, we have actually uh, made it more of a community church rather than residing with the Church of Scotland. And we have five or six services in, in the church a year and we have quite a lot of fun with it. Uh, at the same time, the community have really uh, embraced it. Um, and so it's, it's done very well. Inside is very lovely. It's all made up of pine. Uh, I probably should have picture of, put a picture of the inside in because it's, it's a rather lovely church to look at. And we'll, we'll come on to a development that uh, we've done recently, which is close by the church, which is a, uh, we call it the Dosswinton Journey Garden. So, the McCarpine Lennies, uh, were, having had their very good time, um, anyone who has a good time, they ran out of money uh, actually at the, towards the turn of the century and um, they put an artist in the, church, in the house called Rankin and he came to the house um, in the late 1890s and then they sold uh, the Dalswinton to my family in 1919 at the end of the First World War. So the the Landales came to Dalswinton in 1919 and the gentleman you see on your right um, we get down on our knees on a Monday morning and pray to because he was the man who brought it all together and he was he came from a church again he was the son of a minister in Applegarth near Lockerbie and he went out to the Far East and joined the great Jardine Masons and he became chairman of Jardine Masons, uh, as they call them, Taipans. And then he also was chairman of Shanghai City Council um, and really a pretty important and very lovely man from all accounts. Um, but he, uh, and I think it's such a lovely story, he, having lived in Applegarth, he came back and bought Dalston Estate in 1919 obviously when the country was at its knees after the first world war but he bought it off the mccarpine lenny's and um what he did to the house and that's why i put two pictures here is he changed the orientation of it so where you've got the green climbing hydrangea uh, that was the front door and as you can see in the picture on the right um that that shows the picture and he moved it to the other side. He also stole the pillars. You can see the pillars that are in the building on the uh, on the right, the black and white picture. You can see the pillars are still at the front door. Um, so he he definitely changed the house. Some would argue uh, they, they say what he what all he wanted was a gent's loo and he put that bit on the front. So he did a good job of spending money, that's for sure. Um, and he put a huge grand staircase in there. And actually all he achieved really was a gent slew um, when you look at the house itself. Uh, he did put a lift in, which, is, which can be very helpful. Um, but so he, he said about the house, I, over the time since 1919, I think, all of my predecessors, my, he was my great grandfather, my grandfather and my father, and now myself, I think we can be reasonably proud of how we've looked after the grounds um, and the landscape at Dalswinton because they, they do set the whole place off. So if you ever come and visit, um, I think the grounds really are quite special. Um, and my predecessors did a very good job in making that all happen. So, um, as you can see, uh, you've got the la this is the landscape um, with the Landales having uh, taken over. And one of the things, 
we put into the landscape were some windmills. Um, you can see them in that picture, but when you're sitting on our front lawn, you don't see them. Other people do, but we don't. <laughs> so, but we were lucky, lucky enough to get some windmills. But there's the house residing uh, on its own. The picture with the railway bridge is, um, is what we can actually see from our lawn. But the interesting thing about that picture is we're looking straight into the famous Portrack Gardens, which is um, what the Scottish Garden Scheme has a wonderful garden opening with Portrack. Um, and for those who know it, just on the left hand side of the railway bridge, you can't really see it. But Charlie Jenks, who created Portrack, he manufactured uh, just on the left hand side some perfectly formed buttocks which he put in his garden and they are known as the buttocks for anyone who has been there. But my buttocks are much better than Charlie Jenks's buttocks because you can see in the hill in the landscape beyond him just above his house are some perfectly formed buttocks which are there naturally. Uh, so he, he, I, I have never actually managed to tell Charlie before he died but I can trust you when his son John comes to visit me, I will tell him that story that we've got the perfectly formed buttocks. Um, and then you've got within our landscape, other pictures showing the lock itself where Miller um, sailed his boat and the castle or the tower rather that Miller uh, stole from the other tower and put in the middle of the lock, which you can just see in the middle picture. And then you, you can see the cherries. We, we know spring has come, that's autumn, but the cherry trees are just appearing. Um, I don't know why, but we didn't have a very good picture of the cherries. We, they're just over. But when we look out from what was Miller's dining room and is now our kitchen, that we know spring has arrived. Spring has sprung when the cherry trees come out and it's a really rather lovely picture and then we're looking down the lock in the final picture at the stable block and through the hydrangeas and that that again is a is a lovely picture but i i think we are incredibly fortunate that we sit in what is really a, a terrific landscape um moving on to the grounds themselves and as i say i think uh, the generations of landells have done a reasonable job of this um the grounds are really rather lovely the bluebells are just coming I'm proud to announce that just we're starting to see bluebells appear at the moment. We've got this bridge onto the island with the little tower and the picture below is actually the walled garden which in McAlpine Linney's time was full of uh, gardeners and producing all sorts of produce and you can see in the corner there we've got one greenhouse left which we keep very much for house plants and uh, producing a bit of propagation for the garden itself. And then there are obviously rhododendrons within the grounds, um, as you would expect, and a good Dumfrieshire garden. Um, I, I have to say, the, the grounds themselves are the heart of the estate. They, they absolutely form the center of it. And anyone coming here, I think they leave with the impression that the grounds create the estate and set the whole estate off and and we are i think everyone who comes here is really proud of them and and they're, they're fantastic um so within the grounds next door to the church to celebrate the landells having been here a hundred years we created a, a garden in we opened it well we opened it rather grandly we didn't open it 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 happened from about 2017 but it was finished in 2019 and we asked a, a local um, artist called Sylvie Weatherall we commissioned her and we found this site which is beside the Barony Kirk and we created what's called the journey garden and it really to depict the journey of life um, and it going back to uh, David Landale who went out to the Far East and all the other Landales to join Jardines. The, the logo or the symbol for Jardines and the symbol for Scotland is the thistle. And this, uh, these stones depict the thistle. And in the distance, you can see the red bridge, which was built in 2002. Um, these stones came from the old Victorian bridge, which pre, uh, pre, was, was there before. Um, 
the, the current red bridge, which you saw beside the buttocks. And um, so this has become quite a popular place for people to come along. And the plan is, and it started, when people live, die and work and love on Dalswinton, we will give them a plaque and the plaque will go on to a stone and it will describe what they did on the estate. So we've got a gamekeeper and a joiner and a, um, a tenant, etc. And there's and the plaques, are sadly, but it's what happens, are beginning to build up. So the, it's a rather special place and, and we, we like it, but it was to commemorate 100 years of the land elves being at Dal Swinton. Um, so it's, it's rather fun. Um, so moving on, uh, one of the things we did do, we have done, is this is round the house and the grounds have always been really quite grand and uh, what we've done is, is, is created more of a private garden round the house. The picture at the top left is the greenhouse and I put it in there because largely that's for plants for the house um, and you can see there are various things being grown. Um, the house at the bottom, as you can see, that picture is actually taken from the tennis court um, and we've created a border around the house and the border has got that uh, lawn beside it and it's, um, it's actually an extra room for the house. It's what we perceive as our private garden, um, whereas the grounds very much people wander around uh, at their will, which seems to be, we'll come on to that in a bit more detail in a minute. Um, but we've we've spent, Sarah and I have spent quite a lot of time and effort with with our head gardener um, creating the grounds around the house and quite a lot has gone into this and there's quite good form around the house. We've, we've worked on hedges. My parents put in the laburnum arch, which you can see on the right, and I'll come to that in a minute. Um, but getting the structure right for the garden around the house has been important. And obviously there's the little sweet white summer house. That's quite an old picture actually. It's now uh, covered in a rose uh, and the roses have managed to go the whole way over the summer house. And the laburnum arch, I am sitting in our estate office and the house itself is um, just across the way. And my commute every morning is down the laburnum arch, uh, which really isn't that bad. So, um, and when the Laburnum Arch comes out, it's even nicer. And there's a little junction halfway down the Laburnum Arch, which, which I always call the pinch point, which if I'm gonna get held up, that's where I'll get held up. Um, but no, it's very, it, it's the garden, the garden around the house is certainly coming on um, and is not too bad. So um, what that means is that within Dull Swinton, there are various commercial opportunities that take place and and I have to say a lot of it is driven by the fact that um, the 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 landscape the grounds not so much the gardens because the gardens are private but the the landscape and the grounds set themselves off so that the whole estate um, looks good frankly and uh, 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 I'll just run through a few things that have come about as a result of the grounds. So the the wedding, there's a little wedding enterprise. Uh, we don't run the weddings. It's a third party. They run the weddings and there's a wedding. The first wedding is due tomorrow. So there are 50 people coming tomorrow. Uh, I think that, I, I don't know whether I'm allowed to say it, but I will. So we're rather surprised to find the Bishop of London is coming to take the service in the, in the little church. So that's quite fun, but the wedding the weddings have, have become increasingly popular and they would only be here if the gardens were properly looked after. The picture on the bottom left is an artist impression and it shows um, a farm which you have to drive through the grounds to get to. Um, and a couple of years ago, I was approached by um, a pretty entrepreneurial lad and he has set up a whiskey bottling business called Claxton's and we have helped him uh, refurbish the farmyard and the and he is now rebottling whiskey from all over Scotland and this business I must say through uh, the pandemic has absolutely taken off um, because he's been providing whiskey all over the world uh, in, a, in his bottle but it would not have been possible had we not had uh, uh, good grounds uh, and uh, 
and looked after the place because he, he very much plays on that with his branding and what he's doing. In the middle, we've got a bunch of likely looking chaps, um, but they are guests who come and stay with us during the shooting season. And again, uh, there is no doubt in my mind that if we didn't look after the grounds and look after the policies, that opportunity would not be as good as it is. And in fact, a hotelier two or three years ago from the Midlands who had, I think he had nine hotels, he was just leaving and he pressed a 50 pound note into my hand. And he said, I'd like you to give that to the gardener. And I said, that's incredibly kind. Uh, pray, why are you giving him 50 quid? And he said, I have nine hotels and I look after those hotels very well. And when you drive through your gates, you can tell before you even get to the house that you are gonna have a good time. And the reason why you're gonna have a good time is because the place looks good. So I suggest you give the 50 quid to the gardener and say, well done. So that was a very nice way of him saying he appreciated the fact that the place was looked after. And then on the right hand side is a, um, just a, a, a house in the village. We've actually just let it. Um, and the re we have very few houses on the estate that stay unlet for very long. And one of the reasons for that is um, everybody who has a house on the estate gets access to going around the lock or walk, going for walks. And because it's quite well looked after, um, we almost, well, we do have a waiting list effectively for people wanting to get into the properties. The properties are well looked after as well, but there is no doubt in my mind that the expenditure that we place onto looking after the grounds uh, also rubs off in other areas of the estate. So um, it, it, there, is, there is definitely method to our madness in trying to get the place to be look, looked after in a nice way. Um, so the challenges, just quickly, uh, we all love it, but actually social media has caused us quite a few problems. So people take lots and lots of pictures and they encourage lots and lots of people to come. And um, it's one of the things which is great about the Scottish Garden Scheme is they give structure to people coming to visit the estate. And COVID-19 created a huge problem. And you can see on the right hand side, some cars parked randomly beside the lock. And what happened was certainly in the first lockdown, we were getting at one stage over 50 cars a day, every day of the week, over 200 people, completely unannounced turning up and going for a nice wander around. And they were the sort. They were very nice people, um, but they they didn't really understand what they were doing. They certainly weren't the type of people you would expect to come through from the Scottish Garden Scheme, and it wasn't controlled, and it was all over the place. So, social media has its advantages, but it also has its real disadvantages. And lots of people were taking lots of pictures and lots of wonderful things that they could do, and um, it was difficult to control. And the picture on the left actually is taken from the journey garden looking back towards the church. And we've put in a car park in order to try and control some of this. Um, and that has been helpful. So instead of people just parking wherever they want, um, we've actually tried to control it a little bit. Thankfully, because of um, other places opening up, the problem isn't as great as it, it was. Certainly in June last year, it was a significant problem. And we ended up putting up that rather horrible sign uh, trying to stop people from parking wherever they wanted. Um, it, the, we've, we've got a very old uh, join, uh, not join, a mechanic. And we, when we were putting up this particular sign, he was beside me. And there were some nice people from Dumfries with baseball caps turned upside down and all that sort of thing, which I don't have any problem with, but they were wandering around. And there were three children wandering about and Tim looks as though he's, he's Moses, he looks so old. And he was leaning against the side of his van and I asked these nice people where they'd come from and they said they'd come from Dumfries and I asked them how they had heard about us and they said they'd heard about us through Facebook. And Tim, who was this old chap, looked at the three children who were saying how wonderful the whole place was 
and he said, did that Facebook thing tell you about the crocodiles? And then he promptly got in his car and drove off, which left me with these poor children looking a bit embarrassed. But anyway, but it is a challenge. And I put the picture on the right hand side because it's very important to remember that this is a home. So uh, we've got all of these things going on, um, but it's a home. And the likely lads, including me in the middle, uh, that's the farming staff and we've got the cattle behind us. And one of the challenges we face is um, conflict between different enterprises. And it's important to try and get all of the different the groups from forestry to farming to gardens to property all to work together in order that we don't end up rubbing against each other and that is that is it, it is an ongoing challenge if, if all of a sudden the cattle start galloping around the loch you can bet your bottom dollar the 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 gardener will be on it um so it's it all of those things need working with so how does it all happen? Well, Sarah and I, that's a picture of us too. I thought I'd put us in. That's about 20 years ago, by the way. We look completely different now, but um, I thought we'd put a nice flattering picture in. Um, and then there's Sandy, who's our head gardener. Again, that's quite flattering of Sandy. He doesn't look quite the same, same but it's, it, it does a bit. And that, so we're, three of us really make it happen. Um, we're quite well, I think we're quite well organized. So that little yard, is where the potting shed is as we describe it but the potting shed has everything in it and we we don't skimp on the machinery and and the the things that look after the garden and, and uh, hence i put in a couple of tractors just to emphasize the point um, that by having the kit uh, we can look after quite a lot of ground and sandy sandy is a complete stickler for it uh, and he looks after all the machinery really well and that's what makes makes the makes the thing go around and helps it tick. Um, so uh, finally, we're back to the beginning. I sort of mentioned it earlier, but um, we're, we're in during this period when uh, we have uh, all these people coming. It's actually not only is it brilliant for charities, not only is it really good for gardeners, but actually the Scottish Garden Scheme is quite good. In that it, it gives us a structure in which we can invite people to come around the garden and not and let them know that the garden is open so people can come and enjoy it and the piece around the house which i call the garden is really our private piece which we try to keep people away from but then we let them in and through the garden scheme they know they can come round. and i think it, access is critically important in the in the days in which we live in and we have to allow people access and we have to welcome them and enjoy it and be with it and give them fun and you know all of that it's good fun but at the same time it is our home and so there is there is a moment uh, and i think the scottish garden scheme it's, it's a piece which i'm not sure is fully recognized and understood that the garden scheme gives access to people who wouldn't otherwise get access to some of these things so speaking of which our garden is open on the 15th and 16th of May as an uh, advertisement for those who are nearby. And instead of me talking over a ridiculous Zoom call, which I absolutely loathe, uh, you're more than welcome to come round and see us at that time. And then I can be pleasant and nice to you rather than pretending uh, from sitting in my office. So without further ado, I've probably banged on for too long. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and let you all get involved. There we go.